Mappa is a studio that started as a passion project and would soon turn into anime's most profitable company, making some of the most recognizable anime in recent years. But due to human greed, abuse, and exploitation, it is a studio that has been doomed to fail, with animators coming out publicly about having to sign NDAs regarding the working conditions, staff receiving factory worker level pay, and some even expressing seriously concerning imagery. All of this can be linked back to one man who is responsible for the suffering of many working for the studio and the inevitable downfall of the company. But in order to fully understand why, we need to go back to the very beginning. MAPPA was founded by Masao Maruyama on June 14, 2011, with a vision of making a studio that allowed creative freedom to its animators and to create high quality animation films. Maruyama had a positive reputation for being highly dedicated, creative, having the ability to inspire those around him, and deliver high quality productions on the projects he decided to take on. MAPPA wasn't the first studio he founded, however. He also co-founded a studio you might be familiar with and is key to understanding why MAPPA is destined to collapse. Madhouse, a studio that was highly regarded due to its impressive catalog, notably Death Note, One Punch Man Season 1, Hunter x Hunter, Overlord, Death Parade, Parasite, the list just goes on. In 2011, Maruyama departed from the studio. After his departure, Nippon TV became Madhouse's owner, which started a steep decline. Nippon TV is a company that prioritizes profitability over healthy working conditions and creative freedom, and it really doesn't help that Japanese animators are severely underpaid. According to the TinaFlyEcho.com, entry level in between animators will make the individual drawings only made around $1.83 per drawing, which would take around an hour to make. To put that into perspective, that would be $14.64 per day, which is quite literally breadcrumbs. And speaking from experience, this is the most tedious and time-consuming task in animation. And yet, McDonald's workers in Japan make around six times more money than this. Not only were Madhouse animators getting underpaid at this time, but they were also getting overworked. The studio chose profitability, sacrificing working conditions by picking up tons of projects at once, giving the animators and staff members little room to breathe. There was even an instance where Madhouse violated Japan's labor code for having a production assistant work 400 hours in a single month. There was a day where the production assistant was on his way home at 7 a.m. After working long hours, hungry, tired, and stressed with all the things he had to do the following days, when he would suddenly collapse in the middle of the road. Thankfully, there was a cop that happened to be cycling around that would call an ambulance for him. He would then call to take a day off and return to work the day after. Preceding the incident, he claims to have gotten diagnosed with a psychogenic reaction, which is a physical illness stemming from emotional or mental stress. The production assistant claims he has racked up over 3 million yen of unpaid overtime work, which is over $26,000 USD. After a while of unstable working conditions, many important animators, directors, and staff members that contributed to some of the studio's most successful works decided to leave Madhouse. These departures took a big hit on Madhouse and reduced the quality of the projects drastically and has certainly tainted the prestige the studio once had. The studio had a slow fall off and was practically off the radar for a while up until the anime free run, which has brought some light upon the studio once again. After being CEO of Studio Mappa for five years, Masao Maruyama decided to step down in 2016. He handed the torch to the new CEO of Mappa and the culprit for the suffering of many artists and the individual that is causing the downfall of the studio. This man goes by the name of Manabu Otsuka. His goal is to grow Studio Mappa to garner as much respect and recognition as the studio's youthful table in Kyoto Animation. He has stated that getting to that point would take years and years on end, but his main desire is to achieve this goal quickly. His solution to getting there as fast as possible is to quote unquote increase productivity by picking up as many projects as possible whilst trying to maintain a consistent high quality production. And as anyone might assume from what happened to Madhouse in an industry as complicated as animation, picking up a large amount of projects and expecting to keep consistent quality for a long time is quite frankly delusional. To say the least, this framework has caused the higher ups to make some detrimental blunders. Studio Mappa's irresponsible management became abundantly clear after the studio decided to pick up Attack on Titan's final season. After which studio decided to drop Attack on Titan after after season 3 part 2 due to low profit margins and an insane workload that did not justify the means, Studio Mappa was the only studio that was brave enough to step up and tackle the Attack on Titan adaptation. Mappa had a very tight schedule when producing Attack on Titan's final season, with a deadline of about 10 months while simultaneously working on Jujutsu Kaisen's first season. The team had to create new designs for every character, alongside making the controversial decision of using CG models for the Titan shifters to save time and give the 2D animators some space. Many fans were unhappy with the decision of using CG models, which led to many death threats to the staff who worked on the series, which evidently has seriously affected them. All of this could have easily been avoided had the animation committee not shoved the stick up their ass beforehand, and MAPPA not picking up a project they knew damn well they couldn't handle. No pun intended, Attack on Titan is a beast of a production, with highly detailed characters, lots of action, and lots of moving elements at 
once. This would even be a challenging task for a regularly scheduled production, let alone only 10 months. The animation committee reached out to lots of animation studios such as Production IG, Studio Bones, Cloverworks, and David Productions, but obviously none of them picked up Attack on Titan due to the budget constraints and rough deadlines. Mappa picked up the project while already having Jujutsu Kaisen in the works and several other anime listed for the same anime season, leading to an overworked staff. There was even an instance where one of the directors of AOT Season 4, Teruyuki Aumine, who is famously known for directing the episodes Declaration of War and Two Brothers, tweeted out that he wasn't able to go home for three days due to the workload. However, this is just the beginning of MAPPA's history of abuse. As you may know, Jujutsu Kaisen has gone through lots of production issues and has faced a lot of controversies due to the chaotic and hectic distribution of the show. The first season of the show was a massive hit and undoubtedly exceeded the expectations of most people that are a fan of the medium. The anime received praise for its gorgeous and ambitious animation and overall great adaptation of the source material. Unfortunately, things would get much worse despite of the initial success. As MAPPA decided to pick up more projects, creating tighter deadlines with overlapping key animators and directors on different shows, things began to get chaotic inside of the working grounds of the studio. If I had to pinpoint exactly when things started getting out of control, I would point to the Jujutsu Kaisen Zero movie. Production on the movie started right after the first season of the show was completed, with most of the animators being the exact same that worked on the show. Now, for reference, anime movies usually have a production time of around a year or two, with one of the most popular and successful anime movies, Your Name, having an approximate two years of production time. Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, on the other hand, had a deadline of only four months, which is absolutely ridiculous. To add to that, the same staff was scheduled to work on another beast of an anime, Chainsaw Man, which featured 13 episodes of some of the most ambitious, detailed, and demanding animation I've seen from any anime or just all of 2D animation if we're being truly fair. And it doesn't end there. The majority of the staff that worked on the shows I just mentioned were now scheduled to produce the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. We don't exactly know how much time the staff had to work on the show, but it is estimated to be around 8 months for 23 episodes of action-packed animation that featured a new director which brings a totally different vision for the anime. With the production deadlines being up to Mappa's throat and the studio being notorious for not giving their animators proper training and having them redo their drawings over and over again, the directors, staff, and animators unsurprisingly started reaching their limits. This might seem obvious, but keep in mind that behind your favorite anime, there are real people breaking their backs producing the shows. Mappa asked his animators and directors to sign non-disclosure agreements which would keep them from speaking out about the poor working conditions and the terrible schedules behind the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. As we now know, some of the staff decided to break the NDA and give us insight as to what's actually going on behind the scenes. The director of episode 12 of season 2 of JJK, Shunsuke Okubo, spoke out on Twitter and said the following, I'll tell the world that this is a company that harasses people and keeps them quiet. This following tweet is from a key animator working on the anime. Instead of making people write a pledge to avoid complaints, could you please create an environment where they won't complain? An animation director that worked on the 17th episode tweeted out that they were only able to capture 30% of the intended vision of the episode, which is truly disheartening. The animation and direction is already out of this world, but to think of what could have come out had the schedule been better. Thankfully, it seems as if there's going to be some improvements made in the Blu-ray version of the episode, so we can only hope that the vision of the staff comes closer to what was intended. He also did a cut for episode 11 and shared that he only had 12 hours to complete it. Another JJK animator that goes under the ad Hone 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 on Twitter spoke on MAPPA's decision to sacrifice quality in order to accumulate a larger volume of projects. I don't think the viewers would want the creators to make an anime that is so rushed and sloppy that it ruins their minds and bodies. Aren't most people willing to wait about three months to release the product in a perfect condition? I don't know though. Due to the tight deadlines, there have been several occasions where animators that worked on the show felt like they couldn't deliver their best work. And as we know, anime fans tend to be toxic and inconsiderate of the people that work on the actual shows. One of the animators tweeted out the following. Everyone is not trash like me, so I know that everyone's sympathy and encouragement must be from the bottom of my heart. But right after releasing something that I'm not satisfied with, that kind of thing will have the opposite effect. So for now, I'm just, I want you to leave me alone. I'll make up for it in my future work. Until then, I will live my life as the worst animator who has ruined the masterpiece. The same animator tweeted out that they were hospitalized and was found at risk of heart failure, presumably from overconsumption of caffeine and lack of sleep. Another staff member tweeted out saying, I want to die quickly. And on November 14, 2023, Shunsuke Okubo will tweet out a picture of an anime character with a noose around her neck, which implies, well, you know. This anime character is Emma Yasuhara, who is a key animator from an anime called Shirobako, in which the plot is about making anime. So I think with those pieces of information, we can put two and two together.
All of this goes to show how a simple change in mindset and lack of care for the art can affect the overall working environment and how artists will feel about their work. When there's a lack of creative passion from upper management in an art-related workplace, the company is simply bound to crumble. Only prioritizing profits means sacrificing artistic integrity and having animators work on holy amounts of hours on multiple different projects at once, which obviously means that the overall quality of work from the animators and artists will decline, especially when you combine that with low pay. And if the quality of the shows decline due to overwork and the other factors I mentioned. That means less people will buy the Blu-rays, less people will watch the shows and want to support it, making this business plan extremely counterintuitive. Madhouse proved that this is the inevitable result of this framework, yet Manabu Oska is headed towards the same exact destiny. Masao Maruyama failed at handing off both the studios he founded to the right people that aligned with his supposed values of prioritizing the art, creative freedom, and having a small team. Both Madhouse and Mappa became exactly the opposite, and once they got too big, he left and made another studio. W stonks, I guess. Nonetheless, it really makes you wonder if this is ever going to end for the staff working at MAPPA. And I really don't think it will, up until of course the studio inevitably collapses. We have seen how much damage this way of thinking causes to not only the final product, but to the individual animators, directors, production assistants, and everyone working on the anime. These are real people with lives and families that they go home to that are quite literally risking their lives in the name of Studio MAPPA, Studio Madhouse, that are often treated like replaceable worthless slaves. But I guess that's just the ugly truth of the industry and life in general. I would love for there to be some kind of change at MAPPA, but that simply doesn't look like it's gonna happen. But I can leave you with this. Remember to always support and praise the staff behind the work, not just the corporate name or the collective behind the production.